important day. Want to guess why? I'm giving my first lecture at MIT. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Dr. Gervich, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Dew, and my project is about utilizing machine learning in order to detect the presence of loop extrusion, um, and this is based on using time asymmetry. So um, I'm working at the Murney Lab with my mentors, Mr. Henry Pinholt and Dr. Alexandra Galitsina. And the fundamental goal of my project is to be able to detect the presence of loop extrusion in living systems. So loop extrusion is a biological process that, um, where protein complexes move along a strand of DNA. And this causes the formation of loops in the chromatin structure. So um, loop extrusion is important for the three-dimensional organization of cells in, of, of genomes inside the cell nucleus. And TADs, otherwise known as topologically associated domains, are um, essentially regions inside of the chromosome where there's enhanced interactions with other genes that are a part of the TAD and limited interactions with regions that are outside of it. TADs are bounded by a protein called CTCF, otherwise known as CCCTC binding factor. And this helps TADs maintain their distinctiveness. TADs are important for regulating gene expression, and this is because it allows the enhancer elements that are inside of the TADs to have um, specific and targeted interactions with their target genes. So there are two primary actors in the process of loop extrusion. There's the cohesin complex, which binds to two parts of the DNA and is what causes the loop to form. And there's also the CTCF protein, which acts as a boundary element and helps to find the spatial arrangement of the loop. And so once the, um, once the cohesin complex is loaded onto the DNA strand, um, it moves in a unidirectional manner, much like a molecular motor. And it pulls the DNA on opposite ends of the strand, thus forming and expanding the loop. And then once the moving cohesin complex uh, encounters a CTCF site, the CTCF essentially anchors the loop and stops the growth in that direction. However, like a diode, this only happens if the orientation of the CTCF site as well as the movement of the cohesin complex are in the appropriate direction. So the length of the loop that's extruded depends on factors such as the amount of CTCF sites that are present as well as the amount of cohesin complexes that are acting upon the DNA strand. And so we know that loop extrusion is essential for um, things like ensuring genomic stability, uh, regulating gene expression, and maintaining various cellular processes. However, the exact function of loop extrusion is not very well known. And this is in part because live imaging of loop extrusion has not yet been done in vivo. So the fundamental goal of my project is to be able to detect the presence of these loops inside living systems. And the method that I'm doing this is by taking these movies of DNA trajectories and looking at them both forward and backwards in time. An analogy for this might be um, smashing an egg, for example. There's a very clear beginning and end state. You either have a whole egg or a smashed egg. Now, if you were to use something like a high-speed video camera to record this process, it would be very easy to identify whether you're looking at a forward or reverse process, even if you're just looking at some intermediary clips that are inside this recording. So, similarly to this approach, I'm generating and accumulating a large data set of these DNA trajectories, and then I'm training a neural network to be able to identify whether it's a forward process or a reverse process. And so, to... Um, to sort of look at the feasibility of this approach, I've been uh, generating large data sets uh, using the Polychrome Library. And this allows me to create synthetic representations of my biological polymers. So the first step in generating the data set is to first create uh, a series of um, polymers that do not have any loop extrusion acting upon them. And so this is done by first using a random walk to generate the general shape of a polymer with a predetermined size and length. Then the next step, uh, this is done using the bead and spring model with each bead representing approximately 750 nucleobases. The next step is to apply various uh, forces um, and angle bonds uh, to the system. So things like radius of contact, angle stiffness, bond length, and more. And then this, uh, the simulation is run to the point of equilibrium 
And uh, this over here represents a polymer that has been run to the point of equilibrium graph using that plot lid. The next step is to generate 1D representations of the polymer um, undergoing loop extrusion. This is done by treating the polymer as an array, essentially, with various CTCF sites, as well as cohesive um, origination points seeded throughout. And so as the, um, as the simulation moves from time, time step to time step, the loop expands from B to B. And so as you can see in example C over here, this is where a loop has, uh, a movie cohesion complex has encountered a CTCF site and they're growing in the appropriate, um, it's moving in the appropriate direction. So this stops the growth of the loop in uh, that direction, although it may still continue to grow in the other direction. Another example of something that may occur in example B over here is if a loop encounters another loop. In this case, the loop also stops growing in that direction. However, if you can see in example A over here, if the orientation of the CTCF site and the growth of the um, and the growth of the loop in the moving cohesion complex are not oriented in the correct direction, then the um, cohesion complex will continue to move and the loop will continue to expand. So once I've completed running the 1D loop extrusion simulations, this data is then accessed in the 3D loop extrusion simulations. So much like the equilibrated simulations, the polymers um, are first uh, applied with a, with a bunch of angle and bond forces. And then after that, information from the 1D loop extrusion representation is used in order to generate more forces that connect two parts of the DNA strand together for every cohesion complex that was generated using the 1D simulation. And this over here shows the contact probability versus the set separation. And in this, each block represents a, uh, each data point represents a different block. And so the bump that you can see at around 15 or so units is caused by the angle stiffness. And this was done to ensure that the random walk is able to better emulate properties of a uh, polymer in a living cell. And then the convergence of data points at around 1500 units that you can see over here, um, this is showing that the simulation is approaching steady state. From the 3D simulations, I'm tracking the locations of the CTCF points. And so I'm tracking the CTCF points at a higher frequency than I am um, information about the coordinates for the entire polymer, as well as the energy information. And this is then stored in a CSV file. So this helps me reduce the storage requirement that's required because I don't need uh, to record the information about the entire polymer with such a high resolution. The next step is for me to use time reversal. And so this is the unique method that I'm using in order to identify between whether um, a series of trajectories has loop extrusion or not. And so the fundamental idea behind this concept is the fact that when you look at a series of trajectories for DNA loop extrusion that's going forward in time versus backward in time, there should be a very clear visible difference. This difference does not occur when you have a series of trajectories that does not contain loop extrusion. And so um, the ability for a trained neural network to be able to identify the difference between the flipped and unflipped trajectories should give me a measure of whether or not a series of trajectories has loop extrusion or not. And this asymmetry arises from the nature of loop extrusion and uh, the energy output as the cohesion complex moves across the DNA stream. So I'm using convolutional neural networks and CNN is particularly well suited for higher dimensional data analysis. So things like videos, images, and other forms of structured data. And the CNN learns through a supervised training process where it's presented with a series of labeled training data. So in my case, the data would be the XYZ coordinates of the CTCF sites, and the labels would be whether it's going forward or backward in time. And then uh, by adjusting the weights and biases in this iterative training process, uh, I'm able to uh, associate, I'm able to, uh, the CNN is able to gradually learn to um, recognize and extract key features from the input data, and then use that to accurately classify and predict near unseen data. Um, but an alternative approach to using convolutional neural networks would be to use transformers. And so this is something that I've been considering to use. Um, transformers are a fairly new addition to the world of deep learning and artificial intelligence. And it uses, trans uh, it uses attention as its primary mechanism of action. This allows transformers to dynamically modulate window size, um, weights, and more. Although it turns out uh, attention might not be all you need. 
So this enables greater extensibility for accurate data representation of the nodal, um, as a nodal architecture. And uh, this allows the transformer to be able to um, generate uh, accurate um, output, um, output predictions as well as generative AI outputs um, at a higher efficiency and accuracy than has ever been seen before in AI. So currently, loop extrusion has not been observed in vivo. Um, however, it has been directly observed through single molecule reconstitution assays. Loop extrusion has also been observed through high C data analysis, which gives information about the spatial arrangement and organization of the chromosomes. High C data has revealed the presence of TADs and has also suggested the involvement of loop extrusion in the formation of these TADs. And so we know that loop extrusion is important for um, is a very important morphological influence on the bulk structure of the chromosome, and that. Um, Loop extrusion could be play a role in disease progression and formation, and it could also be a target for preventative, therapeutic, and curative models. So we know that when something um, goes wrong with uh, when there's a morphological or structural fault, it could be because of um, loop extrusion causing a gene to fail to express properly, as opposed to say single nucleotide polymorphism that's caused by a random event like um, cosmic radiation, for example. And so by better understanding the physical mechanisms of loop extrusion, we may be able to um, better understand how time um, in conjunction with, uh, uh, how time can um, influence changes in the new field of structural biology. And so the, res the results of this uh, loop extrusion study, in addition to um, anticipated future work, can help us have a significant, can help significantly improve our understanding of um, how time in conjunction with informational polymeric structures are able to affect basic um, genetic as well as evolutionary processes in complex cells. So I would like to thank the organizers of MIT Primes um, for hosting this event and also for helping us organize our research projects. And I would also like to thank Professor Leonid Murray, Mr. Henry Pinholt, and Dr. Alexandra Glitzina from the MIT Murray Lab for helping me and supporting me through my project. Um, here are my sources and thank you for listening.